This video is sponsored by Chestnut. More about that later in the video. It is about a week since the gradient correction process was actually released by Pixinside. And me and some other YouTubers have released our first impression, our first comparisons to Gragspert, to DBE. But there are some questions which were always asked in the comments, in Facebook forums, and I would like to address eight of them in this session, right after the trailer. Hey, this is View Into Space. I'm Sascha from Switzerland, so grüezi miteinander and thanks for watching my channel. So of these eight points, there's six which I can tell you right here beside the cozy fireplace. And then there are two which you want to look at on my computer. We do that last. So the first point that I would like to address is people who did comparison Gregspur default setting versus gradient correction default setting. And then the finding was that actually Gregspert gave the better results. And that is, in some cases, actually true. But, and that's the crucial part here, the gradient correction process is not a one-button tool. It was not intended as this. So if you just leave it at default setting and press the execute button, you're doing something wrong. Gragspert on the other side is an AI tool and it is fully intended to just press the button and it gives back some more or less satisfying results. So if you're looking for that convenience, Gragspert is probably your better choice. If you're looking for the optimal solution, gradient correction might be the better choice, but you really need to get your head around all the different settings. And as you have seen in my first video, where I showed you unfiltered my first reactions, my first trials, and I just did it approximately what I thought it should be, and it gave rather amazing results. So I firmly believe the more we understand how all these settings work, the better the result of the gradient correction will be. Second point, are DBE and Gregspert still needed now that we have gradient correction? Personally, what my journey through all the astrophotography software showed me is, if you have more than one tool available, it's usually a blessing. And I even start here with the stacking. I usually stack in AstroPixel processor, but there were one or two issues where I actually preferred the WBPP. I'm happy that I have both. And I think it's the same here. There might be cases where the gradient correction will not deliver the results to your satisfaction. Really great when you have two other tools where you can try to get better results. So I wouldn't abandon them but I truly believe that gradient correction will be for the future the default tool of choice. The third question which is floating around is, is background neutralization still needed? And this is kind of a misunderstanding. I don't know where it comes from because background neutralization has nothing to do with gradient removal or correction. So gradient correction is doing the same as DBE, as ABE, as Gragspert. Background neutralization comes later on. And if you're doing SPCC, it's included there. So you anyway don't have to do it anymore as a standalone. The fourth question, and I'm sorry, I did not really gave the answer that, to the question that I actually asked in the first video, are flats still needed? So the answer here, yes, flats are absolutely still needed. The gradient correction tool is not intended to replace flats. And when you have flats, the results will always be better than when you're in a brute force attack, practically let gradient um, correction remove the vignetting. That said, for the cases, especially for beginners who have issues with flats, when you have flats which do not work or you have old data where you don't have flats available for, I think gradient correction does a pretty good job 
to remove all the artifacts that floods usually prevent. So as an emergency tool, great to have, but best practice, still doing flats. Next point, some people said that I forgot to try it on Nebular. I only used Galaxy, Star Cluster, stuff like that. Very true, kind of happened. I think I didn't have an ugly enough picture from a Nebula. Now, first of all, just without even trying it. When I had issues with Graxpert, it was always with Nebula because Graxpert sometimes has the tendency to jump off a bit of the Nebula. So from that point, gradient correction should even deliver the better results for Nebula than it should actually do for galaxies and clusters. But that's theoretical. If you want to have the proof, just have a look at the video of Lucomatico, who also did a wonderful comparison and he used Nebula to show um, a comparison. I'll give you the link to his video in the comments below. The last point I want to address right here beside the fire is some people who actually wondered where I have all the updates from and, and why they were not informed. Now, first of all, whenever PixInsight does an update, you should get a mail. If you do not get a mail, most likely you unsubscribed. But in the mail, a lot of times, there is not all the information. So you find in the mail a link to the forum on the PixInsight site. And it usually is worth actually looking through the forum post where everything, every change is actually mentioned. And there is one of these changes, the filter manager, which I will show you now on my PC, which was actually not mentioned in the email. You really had to go to the forum post to see that something changed there, quite essential. With that, I think we go now to the computer and I will show you two things there. But before we go on, a word from my sponsor. Did you know that more than 50% of my audience are playing chess? And that is why I have Chestnut as my sponsor today. And to be clear, it was me calling up Chestnut and asking for sponsorship and not the other way around, because I'm really convinced about the product and I want to show it to you. But let me explain. Playing chess has changed massively in the last years, even it's a very ancient game. And what I mean with that is online play. You have chess.com, you have LightChess, you have a lot of other services where you can play with people all around the world. But it kind of contradicts what chess is all about. Because if I play chess on my iPad, there's just two things that are absolutely missing. And on one side, it's the three-dimensional view that I have when I have a real chess set in front of me. And on the other side, it's the beauty and the handling, the feeling of the chess pieces that just kind of, at least for me, also belongs to this game. And that's completely missing here. Now, there are compromises you can take. For example, a set like this. You have the three-dimensional view. You can move the chess pieces you're online, you have AI, but there's one thing that such a set is missing. And that's just plain simple. It's a plastic box and it's plastic pieces. And that's just not the same as a real beautiful wooden handcrafted chess set. And what I mean with that is, is something like this here. A tournament size wooden chess set with handcrafted beautiful pieces. That's just amazing. But then again, when you have such a set, you cannot play online with it. Or can you? Because this here is not an old-fashioned set. This is the Chestnut Pro. And if I turn it around, you can see here some control elements. And so while, when I just hold it like that, there's nothing that gives away that this is in any way altered, when I press the button, you suddenly see that some LEDs here are appearing. And so that's really the cool part here, that I can with a cell phone, with a computer, with a tablet, actually connect this to chess.com, to LightJazz, or even play simply with the app. And at the same time, I have the full experience of wooden hand-carved pieces. 
So for me, this is just the perfect compromise out of beauty and technology. And if you feel, by the way, this is too large, there is actually a smaller version, the Chestnut Air Plus, which is also wooden, which also has hand-carved pieces, but is a smaller size. If you're curious about it, please have a look at their website. Link is in the description below. And if you enter the code Sasha, you get a generous discount. And now let's go back to our main topic. Okay, welcome on my computer. So the first of the two things I want to show you is simply there's a lot of people who ask, why can I not find gradient correction? I updated. Now, probably they forgot one or the other part of the update. And the first part of the update you find here in Pix Inside. You have to go to Downloads, Software Distribution, and then you find down here version 1.9.2. And here is the most recent version. That's what you have to download. And usually before you then install it, you have to remove the old version from your application directory. And once you have done that and you start a PIX inside, you will still not find gradient correction. Then you have to go resources, updates, and check for updates. Then it will show you a million of updates that you will have to do as you have just installed um, a new version. You will then say select all, install, and then it will actually download everything. And once everything is downloaded, you still have to close Pix inside. It will ask you if you should install it. You say yes, and then it will really install it and then restart Pix inside. And only then, once all of that is done, you will find gradient correction and you can work with it. The second thing I want to show you it doesn't really have to do with gradient correction but with the recent update because some people got confused as within SPCC they couldn't find the filter manager anymore. And these are the people who have not read the full thread in the forum of what have changed. Because when we go now to process and spectrophotometry until now there was only one entry which was the spectrophotometric color calibration, SPCC. But now there's suddenly here something else, filter manager. So let's first go to SPCC and let's see what changed. And what you will see is that you cannot find here the filter manager anymore. You can just select the filters that are in this menu. So now if you want to add some custom filters, you go to process, spectrometry and filter manager and here if you click on curve explorer a second filter opens and you can look now at the curves of all the filters that are already there. You can also down here export this graph as a PDF. What is really cool if your filter is for example a combination of this one and this one you can say here combine the selected filters to generate a new custom filter. So just click here, you give it a name, a filter channel, and it will create it. The other thing what we can do here in the Curve Explorer window, task, we can actually say import XML filter database or a CSV file filter definition and so on. And we can also create through that a new filter. And as soon as it's in here, it will also be visible in SPCC. So that's it already what I wanted to show you here on the computer. Okay, that was it. I hope it answered a lot of the questions that you had. If you have further questions, please leave it in the comment below and give me a good argument to do even another video with answering further questions. With that, see you next time and clear skies.